Hello and welcome to Together We Thrive, episode number four, dedicated to inspiring and connecting social entrepreneurs. Today, we're going to be talking about the really important topic of the journey of entrepreneurship. So joining me, I have the passionate Nina from Beaver Co. I have the philanthropic Ash from Understory and the progressive Lisa from Social Change Makers. So our, our mission statement is together we thrive leading better business. So as a warm-up question, I wanted to ask you, what does better business mean to you? Better business to me um, is always about purpose and why I'm doing it and that I'm actually doing it effectively. Um, I think that, you know, good intentions, although good, are not maybe not enough, but actionable steps which have, which lead to productive outcomes um, and beneficial outcomes are always the best way forward, especially if it's a cause that you're extremely passionate about and growing that every single day, whether slowly or quickly. Absolutely. And how about you, Ash? Yeah, um, 100% with, with Nina. Um, just to add to that, I think it's also for me about having something that you're working towards, something you're passionate about and something important, I guess, for, uh, for something other than yourself, mm. um, but also um, where you can make a living out of it as well. I think that intersectionality is quite important with better business. And Lisa, what does better business mean to you? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think um, what you know, Nina and Ash have, have discussed is, is right on there. Um, I think also if I was to think about it in terms of like how I can do better business, it would be to make sure that um, I'm keeping focused on my why and to ensure that, you know, the, the, the mission that, that is part of my business and the values, that I stay true and focused on them even when, you know, there's external factors that I may have no control over, like COVID nineteen. So, I think yeah, that for me, it's 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 just trying to stay true to to my purpose and why. You know, like like Nana said, and yeah, um, and always improving. You know, continuous improvement cycles as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, better business can only. Um, get better as you continue to develop and constantly evaluate what you are doing and how you're doing it and, and um, constantly try to innovate uh, regardless of, of the time and help your target audience in, in the way, shape or form that they need the help. Can we just do a quick um, introduction into each of your businesses as well? So Nina, would you like to tell us a bit more about Viverco? Yeah, so Viverco Australia is a social enterprise space in Brisbane. Um, it's, I provide beauty services, so most specifically lash extensions to women or whomever would want to undertake it um, in a prison community. And from each service provided, I fund the education of girls living in poverty in Malawi, Africa. So they are provided access to our girls scholarship program, um, who, with whom I'm partnered with Bikama Academic Centre, which is a school there. And they are also provided access to entrepreneurship, leadership, finance, um, and mentorship for social support and to ease and alleviate them from social pressures outside of the regular school curriculum. That's awesome. It um, sounds fantastic. And you've, um, do you say that you've uh, already helped 40, 40 girls, was it? Yes. Yes, wow. I have. That's amazing. And how long have you been doing that for? I started around August 2018, 2017, 2018, sorry, around August 2018. That's great. That's really great. And how about you, Ash? Can you tell us a bit more about Understory? Yeah, I can. Um, so Understory's main purpose, or I guess mission, is to support other social enterprises um, and my background sort of in organizational psychology. Um, I've worked in that field for, for a few years now. And my co-founder's um, sort of background is within education. He's worked within NGOs for the last few years. Um, so we sort of just put our heads together and thought that, um, you know, corporates don't do people and culture well. Um, so, you know, social enterprises could also use that sort of support. So we thought we'd, um, we'd build some content, some tools, some resources and sort of provide advisory services um, as well. 
So at the moment, we're supporting a, um, a startup in Berlin, in Germany. Um, we've also had uh, sort of talks with a, um, a startup in um, New Zealand as well, which, um, which I uh, went to school um, in. Okay. And um, we're also currently chatting to an organization in Australia to help them with their people and culture sort of practices. And our goal is basically to give, um, give them the tools, the resources, like I said, and the support they need um, to ensure their people and culture works really well. They have high performing teams. Um, and then when they do need to scale and grow, they have the right resources and the right um, know-how to be able to do that well and just focus on their goals and initiatives. Mm. So they don't have to worry about the people and culture stuff down the line. Mm. Can you it. give an example of like the tools and resources that you, you would offer? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess a good example um, at the moment is um, around high performing teams. So a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the content at the moment, we, we've done a bit of a competitor analysis and we've noticed that, um, a lot of the content isn't sort of tailored towards social enterprises. It's quite corporate. It's not readily available. Um, and a lot of social enterprises don't feel like they can approach um, an organization for content because it might not be the right fit. They just don't feel comfortable doing so. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, in the example of high performing teams, um, we'd be able to provide sort of guides for the founder or the co-founder to sort of build high performing teams so sort of um i guess i guess sort of like a playbook of sorts um mm -hmm. if, if that's if for lack of a better word um and yeah that, that's pretty much it and then down the line the idea is that they don't need our support they can just refer to this playbook and the skills they've gained throughout their sort of learning to to be able to do the people and culture stuff well yeah, that sounds sounds really interesting. Can I ask Tash a question here, Rachel? Absolutely. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's really um, really fascinating. Um, I guess from the fact that you you you've come from the organisational psychology background and mm. your co-founder from the education background, mm. so you're bringing your um, you know your skills together. So, are you targeting? Um, managers and founders is, is that who you're actually targeting within the um, social enterprise sector I think at the moment um, we are looking for sort of vision and scale up or startup sort of stages of, of social enterprises um, which means yeah often there's only one person at that stage or two people or, or maybe even three yeah. Um, so in that case, to answer your question, yes, that it will be mainly focused on founders and co-founders and sort of very early on the employees. Uh, and the idea is, like I said, to nail, um, really nail the people and culture at that early stage. So they have the know-how to grow and build out, um, more, more, I guess, easily or more, um, more readily when they need to. Down the track, I think we're also looking at doing some sort of personality sort of stuff or maybe just more general um, employee sort of support um, to ensure that an employee in an organization is motivated, they feel comfortable, um, they have the psychological safety as well to be able to perform well. Um, and all that sort of leads to an organization thriving and meeting their social and environmental goals. Okay. So is that, um, sorry, not to hijack the interview. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I'm just really interested in this because um, yeah. um, my background as well, but uh, it, um, are you using any particular uh, model or models or frameworks? Uh, are you using coaching frameworks? Are you including? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. I'm actually in the process of doing some research around um, a servant leadership framework. So um, I want to actually build my own servant leadership framework as well. Oh, yeah. And how about you, Lisa? So um, I, I uh, a couple of months ago, I um, I closed one of my social enterprises, and um, uh, because I I felt um, I sort of lost my passion for it, but I also uh, felt that um, I could provide more social impact by doing something different that sort of, uh, sits better with my skill set so um i'm starting up a um an incubator program uh, for women um from you know mar that are sort of marginalized or 
uh, from disadvantaged groups and we it will be run in, in uh, initially in Melbourne um, but we will be targeting um, refugees and migrants right. um, and we'll see how that goes um, so this is like there's a few uh, this there's a few organizations that do uh, run such programs and um, you know, and very well, they have great, some, some great outcomes. Yeah. Um, we're just going to try and sort of enhance the models that they are using mm. and um, just with a bit of extra research that we've done and also add in um, some more structure and specifically around coaching um, and also looking at, yeah, the... Um, the way that um, and leadership because um, I feel that really if we can get to a position where we have a train the trainer model so you're actually really building up leadership skills in a certain group within that group um, you know they're the ones that are going to actually move that forward and have total ownership of that project which is you know comes back down to the community development um, um, Issues, but um, not issues. That's not what I'm trying to say. But um, yeah. So that's where that's that's the plan. Um, I'm looking for a co-founder slash founders, um, and I already have some uh, people and partners, and already a group that we're probably already going to work with, and an educational facility where we're going to deliver it. So yeah, so it's it's sort of at that that pre-launch phase where nothing's organised, but like everything will just fall into place, and and it's um, yeah, so it's a bit chaotic, um, and and of course going a bit slower than I'd like because you can't um, meet people in person, and especially when you um, your cohorts are, um, the digital literacy is um, is quite low. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and it's something you'd actually need to meet in person more than anything else. So, yeah, so there's some, some limitations. But, you know, like, you know, we just get, get on with it. So, yeah. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a massive need for that. Um, yeah. I actually work with um, a few businesses that are in a similar sector where they are trying to um, find and create employment um, for, mm. for, for that um, um, niche audience that, that really need um, guidance and strength and support alongside the opportunity to actually um, to give, being given the opportunity to thrive mm -hmm. and um, just right. just be given a chance. Look, I think that, you know, in the startup world, um, there is, uh, you know, there are a lot of incubator programs out there, um, but the way they're designed uh, are definitely not for, for women in general they're not designed for women in general um, because women have multiple roles mm. um, and they also lead and learn differently and so the, that's one issue but then of course you've got the issue of access and the you know the groups where you know I'm looking at wouldn't have access anyway because mm. it's always merit-based um, or you, you know it's um, or it's with, um, you know, university or it's tech-based and, you know, so so there's real gaps there um, and there's, there's a real inequality to access as well. So I really, we're really addressing that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember I was at attending an event with um, Leanne Kemp, the Chief Entrepreneur of Queensland, and she mentioned, or one of the other speakers there mentioned, this similar thing with um, women having difficulty, refugee or migrant women having difficulty entering this space. And that also came down due to confidence um, yeah. and negotiation skills and communication and language. Um, there were also big barriers in that as well. Mm -hmm. do, you, did you, do you find that as well um, in your research? And yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, I think um, a lot of them, um, when they come to Australia, you know, apart from the culture shock, um, they're not really aware of the opportunities to you know, available to them. And so, one thing is to 
help them get get a bit of a mindset around what is possible in Australia and to you know how you can move forward in, in, with your life in Australia and how it actually can be you know you can become independent and earn money through your own business um it, ideally it would be a social enterprise but of course I can't can't uh you know prescribe that to people so um yeah so that that's one thing definitely the digital literacy and the language um is a big factor and um we have to be you know like um yeah we've got to really think about how our um, design of the program is going to address those barriers. And, mm-hmm. you know, like, I mean, I've had um, conversations with um, with people overseas who are running, uh, with actually Australians who are running um, incubators overseas. Um, and, you know, it's, there are ways. You just have to, you know, you just have to be, it just has to be um, just really you know, human-centred design for this group. Um, and um, but we, and we also need to look at then how the technology and how, how it can be delivered, whether it can be delivered, you know, usually through a, a mobile phone because they all nearly have a mobile phone. They can use a mobile phone, but then what they do with that, you know, is, again, it's, a, it's another... Um, this is a barrier issue that we sort of need to address. But uh, yes, Nina, to answer your question. Um, sorry, I do talk on it a lot. So I, um, it's fine. Yes. I love I love everything that you're saying. <laughs> the quick answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great topic of conversation. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Please feel free to um, interrupt me, uh, Rachel, because I, I do waffle on a bit. <laughs> uh, well, I, I believe that this should be a safe space to be able to um, talk about those things. And like I said at the beginning, I am more than happy for us to be having a discussion and other people to be asking questions. So don't don't feel bad about that at all. Um, but today, I guess that we did come together to talk about the journey of entrepreneurship and I think almost every social entrepreneur that I have spoken to have definitely agreed that it is a journey. (laughs) And so, um, Nina, if you could describe your journey of entrepreneurship in three words, what would it be? Challenging. It was fulfilling. And I would say there was also life-changing. Wow. So challenging in the aspect that it probably took me my whole life to realize this is what I wanted to do. And then once I understood what the concept of social entrepreneurship was or entrepreneurship in general, it took me seven years to start up um, my social enterprise, even though I knew that's where my heart was at. And I think I was going through this uh, moment in my life where, okay, well, I know that my passion is to help people. Now, how am I going to do that? You know, um, what I studied business at QT I did not go into that course by my own means. <laughs> I hated business. <laughs> I hated business. I, I didn't do well in business at school at all. So I just put myself in that degree and I was failing courses for the first three years. Um, and there's the final year when I found out um, or when I joined an organization, um, which was like a social enterprise. And that's when I learned about entrepreneurship. And I realized you can use business to help people. Like, mm-hmm. This is what, this is my purpose. And then I didn't know how I was going to do that. And then I spent about three years traveling, um, doing volunteer work, um, working for charities and so on. And I knew that my cause was there, you know, helping people in developing nations, um, helping children. The cause was there. But how do I stay connected to a business idea when it's so different, so separate from my cause, which was being involved with actual creating some kind of good? Yeah. Um, so, you know, after attending all these conferences and events all the time, doing a, a range of activism work um, and having at least 500 different business ideas, um, I was like, you know, you need to find the, the one. And, and then when I came across the, this, lash, this Lash business idea, um, because my friends were doing it, I'm like, oh, I can go into this industry. And the startup, um, you know, starting it up isn't, isn't too difficult and I realize I can create a create great impact from this because Mm. I can also help build confidence in women um, which is another thing I'm passionate about so uh, and I think within a month I 
did the training and the course and then I set everything up and then I founded um, my partner with Bikram Academic Center. Um, so all of this was challenging in terms of figuring out what exactly and how exactly I was going to do that. Um, and fulfilling, of course, <laughs> of course. Um, fulfilling in the aspect that I guess within my first three months, you know, we set a goal, let's, let's try to sponsor, uh, was it around 40 girls into school or mm -hmm. 30 girls into school? And we sponsored about 26, 27 in the first three months. Um, so when I'm so far away from the cause in a different country, it's hard to see the effects or feel the effects. Um, but when I speak to Emmanuel, who's my business partner, um, this is a story that he recounted to me. So what he does is um, in order to source girls, you know, from poverty to bring into the school, he talks to the local pastor um, and then Emmanuel would then go to the family um, or the mother and then he'll say, we're offering your child a free scholarship. And then he recounted the story of how one of the mothers started crying a lot because what happens is that um, they don't have enough money to support the girl's education. So they don't. And if they do, it's usually their son that they put forward first. Mm -hmm. So this young lady's mother had actually completely given up on trying to provide an education for her at all. Um, and usually what that means is that the child will then be pressured to go into early child marriage um, to find a husband or someone or some obviously not in the natural manner or whatever mm -hmm. manner that we, we want. Um, and then, yeah, so Emmanuel offered this scholarship and then mother was in tears and what, what parent wouldn't want that, you know? And upon hearing that, of course, it's going to make me happy. I feel fulfilled. And, um, he sends me photos of the school and then sends me videos. Um, we, it only cost us about $138 to rebuild two of the toilets because it had, was impacted by the floods. Wow. And, and he fixed it up within a weekend. So I did a, you know, a little bit of a fundraiser. Um, and then that all went towards rebuilding two toilets for the students. Um, so fulfilling in the aspect that from us here in Australia, our investment, our financial investment can be as little as $30. Mm. But $30, $40 is three months worth of education for a girl there that's about that's that is two meals <laughs> in one day here yeah. it's so beautiful to um actually be able to hear how um tangible it is to make such a profound difference it's so tangible and for people living there who live on less than one dollar and 25 cents a day mm. um this is interesting so i'm probably rambling on a little bit but i thought if you'd want to know we're dealing with the COVID situation here. Um, we have all the resources that we need. We have our medical facilities, we have food and we have services to support us. Mm -hmm. I know that many people have lost jobs and they're worried and they're stressed and, and I completely understand that. Um, so we're speaking to Emmanuel and over there, the first thing that everyone's worried about is that they will die from starvation because every day they live, they live day by day there. So to go work for the day and that amount of money is enough food for the day. Mm. Um, and what the government can provide is a package, you know, for those who are living in extreme, more dire circumstances, which is a flour and beans um, during the lockdown period. Um, so I think that even us sending $10 was not a, a week of food mm. and so on. And just having that just hearing that that of his experience in coronavirus compared to mine makes me feel so grateful that over here in Australia we have all the, all the opportunities and tools that we can to actually provide for ourselves and and use it to help other people Absolutely. so that's what I found extremely fulfilling about this journey um, and I don't wouldn't want to waste it in any other way you know mm. we have we have access to education in so many different forms mm. we don't have to always pay for our online courses and so on we can get government help um and life-changing in the aspect that 
um, I think there was this pivotal moment in my life where I was in a dark hole. <laughs> you, know, you don't know what you're going to do. Um, no sense of purpose. And I think once I found that, um, I think the, what you put out, the universe will give. So once I put out that I wanted to help people and once I started doing all these things for these girls revolved around my business, um, I, I, I am surrounding myself with a bunch of people who were like-minded. I just felt that the world was lifting me up more and more um, and I was excelling more in whatever goals that I wanted to achieve um, or not even excelling in the goals I want to achieve, but I was actually doing more to help people and living what my, what my values were. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so, that's so beautiful. And um, it's just so nice to know that, um, that you are on path as well as um, all the help that you are um, offering to other people as well, whether it's here in Australia with um, personal self-esteem issues or, or whatever it may be. And then obviously um, overseas as well. Um, Ash, if you could describe your journey in three words, what would it be? You want me to follow that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'll keep it brief um, and then uh, we'll sort of, yeah, it was a really good, really good question because um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about it and a lot of reflecting myself. So to sort of consolidate it, three words was great. So I think the first one um, is thoughtful. Um, and I mean that in the sense that I've been thinking about social impact for a few years now. Um, not in, not in the terms, you know, social impact or social enterprise, but um, more around how I can apply myself to uh, in a more meaningful way towards social and environmental goals. Mm. Thoughtful. Um, second one was challenging, like Nina. I think this is a fairly obvious one for many entrepreneurs. Um, and for me, it was in the sense that it was really easy for me to continue my day job mm. and earn steady income and not step out of my comfort zone and, and just not do it. It was just really easy not to do it. But at the same time, you know, you, you have those quiet moments and you're like, I need to do more and uh, I need to do something that, um, that, that fulfills me but also makes a, a meaningful impact on the world. Um, it's also quite challenging to name your organization. We've only recently <laughs> named ours, so that's another challenging aspect. Um, fulfilling was the other one, and Nina said this um, as well. Um, it sort of speaks for itself again. Um, I'm just extremely motivated and passionate about working in this space, um, and more importantly, I think, with like-minded people that I can collaborate with. Mm. That's me. Absolutely. And I think I, what I love about what you do is that you know what you're good at and you know that um, you can just adapt that to help um, like the, the reach that you, that you actually really want to be helping. Um, absolutely uh, can relate to um, I could have stayed in a full-time employment and be very comfortable, but I was so uncomfortable um by disaligned values that that's like definitely pushed me um to do what i do that's it uh, yeah how about you lisa for me um I, I, you know challenging is is definitely up there um but it's also exciting um i, I, I love the excitement around learning new things and just the possibilities that uh, for your, not only for myself but for others is, is really exciting and that's what keeps me motivated, you know, the change that you can actually create or the impacts that you can actually create. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for the third one, um, doing this actually helps me to stay grounded. It's, it might be a bit of an interesting one to, to say but I... And I think it comes down to what, you know, the three of you have said about, you know, finding like-minded people, mm. you know, finding a tribe, so to speak, or feeling that, you know, you, you finally 
you find me chatting to someone who gets it, you know. And so I think for me that is really great and it sort of keeps me, keeps me a bit grounded and and, um, and I think I need that because I can get real carried away in the excitement part of it. Um, and, yeah, so, you know, constantly chatting to people, constantly, you know, learning new things from, from others and, and, and sharing you know, my knowledge as well, which I also like doing. Um, and it, it just, yeah, it keeps me, it keeps, it keeps me grounded in terms of, you know, doing this, doing this work. Um, and probably a little bit insane as well in a way, because I think um, I'd be so bored if I was not doing this. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Ash and Nina, if you aren't um, across social change makers, Lisa actually has a uh, Facebook group that she facilitates. Um, oh, okay. Lots of awesome uh, conversations around, um, yeah, the social enterprise space. And so obviously um, you've got your um, future um, vision, um, Lisa, and, and work in the pipeline, but you're, you're still working every single day um, towards your mission. And it's, it is lovely to be, to be a part of it. And um, yeah, absolutely connection and um, community, especially in a time like this, I think it's been really vital. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. So when entrepreneurship was just a um, pipe dream, um, something that you always thought of oh, that that would be nice to to be a business owner um what did you think it would be what what did you think it would look like i thought it was going to look like um do you know silicon valley <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i thought it was going to look like a bustling hub of people achieving great things and then um I wouldn't know how to describe, but like, you know, people in tech, people across different industries coming together and working on it all together. Um, thought it was going to look like, you know, not doing a full-time job, but day in, day out, you're super very motivated and super excited about what you're doing. You're getting up every morning and doing everything that you love um, and having fun doing it. And that's, that's well and true, but there have been days, weeks, months, <laughs> where sometimes I don't, I don't, I've struggled to find that motivation or excitement, especially during like times like this. And um, the momentum um, sometimes sighs down a bit and then grows. And then um, I'm a quite a positive person. And sometimes, you know, when I said I expect tangible results, like immediately and for it to work out immediately, like, oh, okay, I'm going to grow th this many clients within this many amount of this many weeks and so on. And it's much, much harder <laughs> than, than I realize. And it takes much longer. But that's okay because um, I know that when I chose this path, I chose something that I'm passionate about. And you can also fail at something that you're not passionate about. So not failing, but like, you know, if, at least I can fail at something that I am passionate about. Yeah. Um, or at least, you know, learn, learn from it. Learn from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's kind, of <laughs> that's kind of what it's like for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not all just like, I, I started in my mum's living room running my business. Yeah. And I've moved into a second bedroom <laughs> in my current place. So it's not this very nice looking studio with um, crystal clear mirrors and nice green potted plants and air con and <laughs> so on that I kind of, what it would be yet <laughs> not yeah. yet yeah not yet that's what it's like for me <laughs> I think you're um so right in the um conversation is that it does take a lot longer than you think and I think um personally one of the things that I thought is um I looked at what I could make per hour as a freelancer or helping people do this and then I'd look at how much that I could make when I was working for someone else and I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. I only have to work 10 hours a week. But there's just so much more work that goes into it and also so many more expenses um, that I think it's really easy to get really excited about, or I personally get excited about numbers. And I plug all these numbers in of like, if I have this many clients, then I can make this much. And then I can do this um, amount of good with the amount I'm making. But I think it, one of the things that I have really realized is um, 
just to stay really um, realistic and yeah understand that everything <laughs> takes time and um like the feeding the beast but the beast isn't moving kind of yeah. thing um having to do a lot of administerial stuff that i didn't realize came came with it <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, that was different. Yeah, absolutely. The working on the business <laughs> yeah. side yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about you, Ash? Um, yeah, this was an easy one for me to answer because I don't think entrepreneurship was ever a dream for me, really. Um, I think it was more. I have this goal. Um, or of you know working towards positive social and environmental impact and you know continuing to think about well how can i get to get to achieving that goal um what short steps or little things can i do today that would sort of get me there um so yeah i think by having a clear vision about where i wanted to go um and like i said taking those small steps towards it i thought you, you, you know, you know, which included gaining skills and experience and all these other things to sort of get me there. Um, mm. Yeah, I guess that's that's how I sort of entered entrepreneurship or just sort of stumbled into it, I guess. Um, and at this point in time with myself and my co-founder, this just makes sense. Um, it's probably... It's never easy. I think Nina's covered that and, and you as well, Rachel. Um, it is challenging. It is, it is difficult, but um, I'm not currently working a full-time role. So I do have the time. COVID-19 has also been sort of a blessing in that way because I've been able to dedicate such a, such a good amount of my energy and time to this. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's it. Awesome. And how about you, Lisa? I know that you've um, obviously done a few things in Social Change Makers is uh, your latest venture, but do you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, uh, I guess um, having a, a few more years on all of you, I, <laughs> I've got the benefit of hindsight. But, um, yeah, look, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, like, you know, when, when I left school, there wasn't, you know, there was only about half a dozen careers that women went into, basically. Um, and, but I, I, I was always interested in business, definitely. Um, I, I never thought of myself as being an entrepreneur. You know, like I, I always, you know, did, um, you know, started up like little businesses on the side, but I kept, um, I kept going with my career, um, you know, as well as, um, all the other things that, you know, some women do, like children and that sort of thing. But um, so and, and now that I'm at this stage of my life where I don't have um, as many obligations in terms of making sure that I need to have a proper, you know, set income and, and things like that. Um, and I only discovered, you know, social um, enterprise or social entrepreneurship you, you know like it hasn't I mean it's been around for a little while but it hasn't sort of um, been big in Australia you know for for, um, for that many years Absolutely. and we're not yeah I mean it, it's been in other forms you you know in terms of you know people you know doing good in their business or giving to charity or, or you know like other you know there's been other forms um, and in fact you know like I was running um a business where um you know i would i would buy you know fair trade products or i'd buy eco-friendly products and things like that and and um you know in that way I, it is a, a impact business it's a full purpose business um but i got to the point where you know when i discovered the uh, actual you know framework and there's there was a variety of um, explanations for social enterprise um, I thought well this is really my dream because my career was always about uh, helping people it was always in the the it was always science orientated but it was you know in the helping field um, 
and then but I always loved that business side of stuff and then when I came to to really understand and the opportunities that were opening up and you know the the schools that were opening up in Australia around offering you know social impact and social enterprise um, modules um, you know, I got really excited because well, this is my dream. Now I can put the two my two passions together and do really, what I really want to do, and you know, create some real impact and and be able to measure it as well. You know, like a lot of the the work that I've done in the past um, is not necessarily measurable, um, just because of the sectors it's in. But I like now that you can you can measure your impact. And I'm really keen to to make sure that um, you know whatever whatever um, social change makers does as an organisation really measures what we're doing um, because I think that's that's the key to be able to move forward and and to scale as well. So yeah, so that's where I'm at with that. That's what my idea was of you know yeah. How 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 are you planning on on measuring that at the moment? Um, <laughs> yeah, don't know. <laughs> no, we, we, uh, no, I uh, look, um, that's all going to be in the design. Um, yep, yep. and as I said before, we're all, we're still in that design phase. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm chatting to a couple of people that, uh, that's their field, you know, social impact measurement. Um, and so we could have, um, we could have them come on board. Um, there's a, there is a lot of different ways, but I'm I'm so interested in it, like just because I've got nothing else to do, I'm sort of I'm even thinking of going and you know doing a post graduate or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, but you no, know, it's a good question, Ash, and I don't have that answer. And yeah, hopefully, yeah. maybe you know if you speak to me in a couple of months' time, I might. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, unless you've got ideas, because I'd love to hear if you if you know any of you have got any ideas of how you can. Yeah, sure, Nina. <laughs> No, I just, I know I, I studied um, social entrepreneurship at UQ and there was uh, a part of our course which was focused on um, measuring social impact and our return of social, like return of investment for someone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they taught us how we could break it down and it was very, very in-depth. <laughs> Probably the most difficult part of my course that I've ever done, <laughs> but it was the best thing I've ever done as well. Um, yeah, and I, I might know someone who will be able to help. Who was my um, colleague, and um, yeah, he he got really high grades. So <laughs> yeah. oh, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. Really yes. Yeah, definitely. yeah. Um, I think um, for specifically what you're doing is that there will be a measure of first and in first-hand impact but then the measure of second-hand impact because there'll be that first hand of how many people that you're actually um like that really tangible stuff of like how many people that you're um getting through the program and, and what that equates to yeah. but then there'll be that second hand of especially if they are doing um impactful work or if they're um creating employment for other people for other um women that are um, have those same vulnerabilities and things like that. Yeah. So I think um, it will obviously be um, some form of communication, ongoing communication for you between um, the two Definitely. to make sure that you can keep a track of, of all of those things. Definitely. And I think also uh, um, one thing that I'm really mindful is is that, you know, you, is to be quite, um, you know, you don't need to measure, like, you don't need to measure you know, hundreds of things. You need to just do, um, you know, measurements um, in a certain time frame. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're measuring the same thing or the same way, but you're still getting that information and that data which you can pull into a report and that, you know, can explain, you know, things. And because the way we design, uh, the way it's been designed is um, um, the expectation is that not everybody will come out as an entrepreneur. Mm. And, and that is that is completely um, completely an upside down, down model for an existing incubator where the expectation is, you know, you do the modules, you do the work and you come out as an entrepreneur and a VC will hopefully fund your project. Um, whereas, 
uh, there's that, whilst obviously, ideally, that would be the expectation, um, there are other pathways they can take because I think there needs to be an allowance where um, you might get halfway through something and you think, this is actually not for me or it's not for me at this time, but I've, um, I've developed all these skills that are transferable into a job, into a career, I might want to do more study. So, yeah, so it's... Um, so, and also we'll be uh, really keen to, to look at um, around impact around, um, around leadership qualities as well because we, you know, to keep this program sustainable and long-term and keep it going and for the women to have ownership of it um, at the end of the day, um, we need to be able to um, have those leaders and, and, you know, to be able to measure that that impact is that what we're what we're developing within their leadership skills is is actually working and and you know that's happening so yeah it's really interesting and like I don't know enough about social social me impact measurement to to really speak too much to it so yeah I'd love some help so thank that's you a, that's a really good idea um because like I think one of the things that we did in uni was a refugee integration into society society um kind of that was our idea and we had to measure the impacts and stuff and um by the way of doing that it was to see how they felt about themselves after afterwards so it was like a survey and then um like how do you feel after undertaking this for someone mm. um what skills do you feel you have acquired mm. and then and then assessing maybe if they were to go into business assessing how long, how long it took for them to do it. Like if they, I don't know how to explain it. So like within like a six month period, seeing if they did go on to start new businesses or use their skills to go on further into another career, you know, mm -hmm. like measuring acquired skills, like you said, like leadership skills and so on. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to think around it. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think you put like, that energy, that thinking energy into your own business. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. I think a good place to start would maybe be to look at some of the statistics um, to actually prove that there's the problem, which you have probably already done, and then look at what you could do to. Um, evaluate and um, prove that you have that that solution um, and and what going through your course by um, rather than either other pathways or um, mm. other um, options that um, what what makes your course um, specifically unique to you um, I think is going to be really really valuable and mm. obviously from a marketing perspective I would just say when you do know what that is make sure you communicate it everywhere and often <laughs> <laughs> because you don't know who's going to be listening and these days they say you, you need to um, have about 13 touch points before someone like buys from you or really even knows who you are as a brand or what you do and so yeah from a marketing standpoint I'm just like just uh, when you know what it is go hard at it <laughs> Uh, look, I, I'm uh, yeah. Look, I, I don't. I, I like business, but I'm not really that. You know, like into that that selling, and I love to. I love to waffle a bit. So, um, actually, getting to be succinct and and you know, getting a pitch down to like thirty seconds or whatever is that's my challenge. That's what I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go and get some coaching on that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing is, is that if you really need to do it, you find a way. If you know that you only have 30 seconds with Absolutely. someone that is the, the difference between um, like getting that course going or not, you, you'll know how to communicate. It. That's right. <laughs> um, actually, while we're on that topic, um, obviously part of your process, um, although you're not necessarily... Um, like you're obviously trying to guide people towards entrepreneurship um, and it might not necessarily be that that is the path that they take but um, one of the questions that we had was what other qualities do you believe of a successful entrepreneur and that probably also um, brings light to what type of qualities um, would you be looking for um, in the women that you would be 
um, like putting onto your course? Um, yeah, look, I mean, that's, um, yeah, that, that's a, that's a bit of a tricky question. We, I mean, ideally we would like them to self-select, um, to, to come on. Um, the, at the moment, the design is uh, the length of the program is going to be about three years. And so we, um, if we can get enough, um, you know, if we can get enough funding to, to start it and and get that happening. But that's the aim. Um, and there will be um, a lot of sort of, um, there's a, there's, there'll be a lot of like pre, um, pre-incubator programs that, that will build up. So um, what we will be looking for are um, women who are, one, uh, interested um, to do that, that, are, that seem to have motivation and are really interested to um, learn the opportunities that are, uh, is possible for them in Australia. Um, that are prepared to work on their digital literacy because uh, we also need them to have that to run a business very well um, and to be successful because you've got to have you know you've got to know how to um, you know how to how to run an FPOS machine and you know all those sort of things um, and the the other um, one thing that's really important is. Um, to be able to have the support um, of their family, um, particularly in those communities. Um, whilst it's really, you know, like it's really important um, because um, their families, in a way, can be a barrier. So, um, you know, we we're going to be. I guess it's going to be a, a little bit sort of a um, a weeding out of of people once they get to the actual last stage, which is actually the full-on incubator stage, mm. where they're going to be, you know, given loads of coaching and, and everything else. Um, but, yeah, so that's that's sort of the type of... I guess it's not really um, a characteristic. It's more about their willingness, their curiosity, um, their ability to, to be coached because that's a big thing. Um, it's not everybody wants to be coached and that's okay too. Um, so, yeah, so that's sort of where what the, that's the, I guess the qualities um, we'd be looking for to get to that last stage. Um, anywhere between day one and that last stage, which may be two years, um, there'll be no weeding out because that's that's their pathway and they can choose whether they want to continue on the entrepreneurial pathway or the career pathway or the education pathway. Um, yeah, so there's three pathways that they can continue along. Yeah, that sound, sounds great. Um, and sorry, but they, and they also can come back into, like they can swap if they want to, um, but... Oh, yeah, the nuts and bolts of how that might happen, I'm not sure, but um, maybe not necessarily um, the first run. But the the aim is is that the, it can it can be interchangeable um, depending on where they are at, at their in their in their life because we want to make it as accessible as possible to women women who um, who are often looking after a house, often looking after children, maybe also doing part time work. So you know. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's not going to be linear is, is actually what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely one of the things that you mentioned earlier is that um, the idea of it being quite adaptable um, compared mm -hmm. to other um, things out there. And how about you, um, Ash? What qualities do you believe um, you would see in a successful entrepreneur? I guess it's a similar um, similar thing for you because you would probably be working with um, people to build teams and they you would probably be um, coaching them and helping them mm. uh, answer this question too <laughs> yeah yeah 100 percent um i think obviously passion is is a key one if you're not passionate about 
um, your your social enterprise and what you're trying to achieve, then that it will be difficult, obviously, to to achieve your your goals. Um, I think it's also important, and it was really interesting when myself and and Toby, my, my co-founder, were were sort of building our own organization. Um, we were re- we were talking about values and you know our vision and our mission, all the important things that you need to do, and really nut out properly before you um, before before you put yourself out there. So the other important one I think is acting with your values in mind, both at work and with each other and how you, you know, you act with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, then I guess with your, your clients or your customers. Um, and then also I think in your personal life as well, I think you really have to embody it and, and sort of live, live, you live your values. I think mm-hmm. that's really important as well. Um, the other one I would say is um, it sort of links to communication. So, um, well, <laughs> Similar, similar to what I mentioned. So we, we've been on this journey of sort of signing this organization and um, it's really important and, and interesting to know what our limits are and how we complement each other. Um, often, you know, I was listening to this podcast today about Bill Gates and, 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 um, and his co-founder, I guess, Paul Allen, when they first started. Mm. And um, the whole point of it was that you can't, even Bill Gates needed a co-founder. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that I'm Bill Gates, so I'm not saying that my, that Toby's Bill Gates, but um, everyone needs a co-founder to collaborate with, to communicate with, and to, to know your limit um, and where you, you, you need to be able to say to yourself that I need help with this. Mm. And that's not limited to your co-founder. It can be limited to partnering with another organization, um, collaborating with, with, with another organization or another entrepreneur, bringing people on at the right time that have a particular skill set. Um, having those conversations can maximize, I guess, your, your individual skill set because you complement and bounce off each other really well. Mm. It's um, interesting, actually, because the, that um, communication aspect actually came up in one of our other um, no, okay. that we had but the communication actually was also about the communication in setting the boundaries mm. of like the different especially for people that their co-founder are also um someone that they're living with whether it could be a um housemate or a yeah. um partner or, oh, wow. and so there's obviously communication is um mm incredibly key because you also need to be able to communicate when you need to um you can't help but become um friends when they are so succinct with your values and uh, align with you but then you do have to have quite clear boundaries with your um communication and things like that to make sure that's that's a great point rachel we actually had a really he he said afterwards that it was it was one of the most difficult conversations, you know, he, he's had in, in a while um, because we talked about, well, what happens if we need to fire each other? What happens if one of us leaves? What happens if, you know, we have an argument, we disagree on something. So we actually drew up some, you know, a form of agreement between the two of us um, on how we would operate. So that's a really good, re- really good point. Glad, um, glad you brought that up. <laughs> it's obviously, uh, yeah, something that, actually um affects uh social entrepreneurs across the board because i think it's very easy to also want to um we are helpers we want to help um Mm. a lot of people and so sometimes it's um easy to think that we're helping by not having those tough conversations but it's actually hindering the business in the long run um nina are there any things that you can add to uh what you think um attributes to a successful social entrepreneur? What qualities do I believe a successful social entrepreneur should have? Um, Also in alignment with what Ash said, definitely passion because um, I think it's very easy to get excited about something but then lose motivation and lose momentum. There are many days where it can go by and you don't want to do any work at all. But um, the fact that I have a passion for a certain cause and I remember that um, 
helps me just commit to daily boring tasks that I know will effectively um, benefit what I want to do in the, in the long term. I also think a high level of resilience um, and that self-resilience to our own negative thoughts and resilience towards what other people say. I believe that many of us have had this experience, um, you know, like what Lisa said, like lack of support from families, friends, people who love us and who are closest to us, but not because they don't dislike us as a person or anything, but just because sometimes they don't understand. Um, and I think having the resilience to go against what everyone else disagrees with and knowing that we're in line with our passion and it's what we want to do. Um, and self-awareness, um, personal development, you know, emotional intelligence, all of that, because I could, let's say I was very ignorant about my shortcomings um, and I kept going on about it and, like, I think that I'm creating impact but really I'm not doing anything and, and um, understanding that it's not ego that's pushing me forward but um, learning how to reflect on where, on where I need to grow um, mm. and my own weaknesses um, and receiving that from other people um, and, and having the open-mindedness um, and maturity to acknowledge that maybe what I'm doing isn't the best way or there are other ways that I can do it um, and being open-minded about other ideas and opportunities and not just a one set mind, um, which, which is limiting in itself. Um, and yeah, emotional intelligence with the people that we work with, the people that will come across in our journey, the people who can help us and the people who can't help us too, because the people who can't help us, they, I think being civil or showing, showing that just because someone can't help us, but still being able to treat them as if they can, like it shows who you are as a character. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, I think many of us have experienced people who I guess didn't have quite such emotional intelligence <laughs> and we know how that impacts us and how it impacts morale how it impacts teams and um yeah so those are my other four core th four core things that i wanted to just add in yeah i think um i mean we've probably just created the perfect person if they have all of those <laughs> qualities <laughs> um they, they just sound delightful <laughs> um i absolutely agree and actually i think it's nice um what you touched upon and it also brings me back to a conversation that we had um, in one of the other groups that they actually suggested they um, they really believed in journaling but they also um, wanted to do something for their sister to make sure that that she if she was going to um, start this journey that she started it by she gave her a an empty book but she said oh, I'm gonna give you this book but you have to do me a favor you're only allowed to write what you have accomplished in the book so it's not like a journal in saying oh, I I have tried I, I wanted to do this this and this but I didn't succeed like it's literally just a book that just has everything that you did do whether it is just that phone conversation or it's um, typing up three emails or what whatever it is but actually having something um to look back on and be like this this every single task that i did however menial it might feel um as a business owner like actually having that tangible thing to be like this is why i am where i am and this is what i can do to um to move forward because i know that i can do this i love that i'm going to start doing that i thought the same i love that <laughs> Yeah, I thought exactly the same. I just thought um, it's so easy to beat yourself up yeah. um, and think, oh, I'm not where I wanted to be. I'm not making the impact that I wanted to. I could be doing this. I could be doing that or comparing yourself to other businesses that are doing something similar and just think, look, that's their journey. This is my journey. And I actually have, have journaled that. Yeah. 
Great um, idea. It's almost like a positive to-do list or a successful to-do list almost, you know? Yeah. Don't absolutely. you ever feel that when you start thinking of, oh, I completed this, 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 and this, you start to feel more like, yes, I can do more. I'm productive. But when we think, oh, I forgot to do this. I didn't do this. I didn't do this. We start to defeat ourselves and, and go sink lower. Do you, do you ever get that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let focus on the positives. There are always going to be things that you can do in business. It's the list is never going to end. Mm -hmm. And so having a list of everything that you did do, I think is is um, really important. And I don't know, maybe every you give yourself a treat every 20 pages or something like that. So to make sure that you actually celebrate all of those little things that you're doing. Um, if you could give any advice to other social entrepreneurs um i guess in general but also specifically about um if, if, if they're about to start this journey um what what advice could you give so i think um figuring out or, or doing doing the hard yards of, of figuring out how how you can use your skills to, to to make an impact or make a difference i think that's really important i think often Maybe not often, but I feel um, people may may want to jump into the first idea that that they see or, or or that they have. But really, really thinking about and reflecting on your skills, what skills are, are transferable as well? Um, what skills have you gained in your career that you can really apply to to something that that you are willing to to give a lot of energy to? Um, I think if you have, you know, really good conversations, I think, you know, a conversation like this, for example, is, is really positive because it helps all of us consider further, you know, what else we want to work on and other things that we need to, we need to think about. Um, so continuing to having those conversations is really important as well. Yeah. Um, and then also you don't maybe need to start your own organization or your own um, enterprise. Like even even a small step of, of working with an existing organization, sort of similar to the space where you can say, you know, I've also thought of this idea. So, you know, what do you sort of think about it? And just having that conversation with, with a founder or a co-founder around that. I think that's also quite quite useful and quite powerful because you're joining an established company. You can you can provide your idea, your insights, your even even just your um your passion um they'll really admire and sort of want that sort of um sort of input no matter what stage stage they're at as, as well so it's great to start your own organization i'm not obviously discouraging anyone from doing so um but if there is something that you can start with i mean by by joining an, an existing organization then then why not any experience is good experience if yeah. you decide to learn from it and so absolutely um you can use that as a stepping stone um for sure. Uh, Lisa, do you have any, any advice? Uh, that you would yeah. Um, I was just thinking when Ash was, you know, talking about, about that, there's, you know, that um, there's the concept of being an intrapreneur as opposed to an entrepreneur, which is like, and I think that's sort of what you were describing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's great, great advice because, you know, not everybody wants to be up for the challenge and, but they still want to, they're still passionate and they still, you know, feel very strongly about about um, a mission or values and um, and are very creative and innovative, but they just don't want to have the the headache of um, being an entrepreneur. Um, look, I, I think um, advice. Um, and, and sorry, uh, Lisa, before you go, and I was I was also just going to add to that by saying that. Um, they often might not have the, the finances or the time, you know, they've got family commitments or, exactly. you know, any, any other sort of sort of exactly. thing that might be hindering them. So yeah, that's another really good point. Yeah, absolutely. There are lots of ways to personally stay on your path mm. Um, mm. outside mm. of entrepreneurship. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Um, I think for me, um, some advice would be that it's, um, a long journey, it's not a sprint. Um, and, you know, in the startup world, and we hear a lot about, you know, sprints and 
you know, accelerating and things like that. But I think as long as you're moving forward, um, it's it's fine. Be be okay with that. Um, develop resilience because uh, that you're definitely going to need that. Um, what's the lovely idea? Of, I absolutely love that idea of you know journaling your accomplishments. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that are just absolutely crap. So, you know, it, 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 and just to be bouncing back and, you know, those things are okay because that's what happens as well in the in, in the entrepreneur world. Um, but also, look, you know, get people around you that are supportive. Mm. Um, it is a hard, hard journey. Um, it's an exciting journey. It's hard. Um, so you do need your supporters, you know. Um, you must have those supporters around um, because that's really important. And um, you know, like I, I wouldn't all you know, like I started up a couple of businesses by myself, and I wouldn't do that again. I think that even even having a partnership or you know, or partners is also a challenge for sure. But I think you, um, there's it, uh, people are bringing you know a different viewpoint, different skills, and and in that aspect um it can the the whole um not, not only the journey but your your organization is very enriched by that whereas when it's just you as as the entrepreneur um you know the buck stops with you stops with these stops with you and it's not a shared experience and human beings uh, actually crave shared experiences i mean we all not you think about when you're going on a holiday and you know like we all want shared experiences so and, and it's no it's no different being in business. So um, that's I guess that would that'd be what I, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. And to add on that, I also think um, it's great to have a support network, but I also really believe in finding one or two people that would be your potential target audience. So you can constantly check back in. You hear a lot of fluff um, and a lot of other people that want to give their advice or. Um, yeah. Their, their message messages or things that you might hear might start to make you think, am I going off course? Am I not doing the right thing? And so I think having a sounding board of a couple of people that you actually, um, they are the type of people that you would be doing work with helps you to um, make sure that you are on your path and that you can constantly sound in on them, uh, use them as a sounding board to, for your, any of your innovative thoughts. And um, they actually really challenge you. They, yeah. they really challenge you to continue to think outside the box and, and continue to move forward um, because they are constantly looking for new solutions. And they've got new problems. And so I think it's, it's really um, a really good um, team to have um, or, or a couple of people to add to your team. I, I mean, I know a lot of, um, I know a couple of um, younger women um, who have become very successful in running their social enterprise. Um, and they started sort of out here in Australia um, and they have advisory boards and like I think you know whether it's an advisory board or an advisory committee you know they're, they're, you know that's that's what you're wanting you're wanting that feedback of what you know and and getting um, whether it's it's um, from your customers or whether whether it's from other people who are more experienced than you but you know like that I agree that's that's important. Um, and one little tip I have um, to overcome the procrastination um, is um, I like when I'm sort of like either overwhelmed or I'm thinking this this is never going to end or I'm just tired but I know I need to keep on going. I just say to myself, what can I do in the next ten minutes that will help my business? And when I say that, I just think, oh, that's, you know, that's fine. Let's see, it's just ten minutes. You know, I can make a phone call, I can send an email, you know, I can read an article, whatever. So. I think that's just really just to make it normal and not too much, you know. So that's that gets me gets me sometimes that gets me a bit through the day. Multiple ten minutes is. Yeah, I actually had a mentor once that said to me that um, no task can stay on your to do list for more than three days, and so no, if if it's if if you put it off by three days, it can't be that important, <laughs> and so it either makes you because it is actually important, it makes you just get it done and get it done quickly, so it doesn't stay on that list for three days, or um, yeah, make makes you um, subconsciously make that decision. 
um, that, that that's not the right decision for your business because um, procrastination is definitely a real a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Nina, um, did you think of anything to any did advice? Have, I did have some ideas of advice. I would want us, um, you know, to tell someone who wants to start the journey. Um, I think that in my position, experimenting is okay. Like the journey itself is so much fun. <laughs> it's so hard sometimes because we don't know what we're doing or where we're going. But, you know, after experience, experiencing like what Ash did, like working for different organizations, working for different charities and so on, working with different um, hubs of people, um, all of those experiences, even though some weren't, where I needed to be or where I necessarily want to go or some of the failures, everything was a lesson and everything I developed some type of skill from um, and some type of knowledge, which I now use in my current business. Like, like I told you, I, when I started studying at QT, I was failing subjects. <laughs> I thought I didn't remember a single thing, but um, turns out I do know, <laughs> do know quite, a, quite a bit, which I now use. Um, and I think that, my derived experiences have formed, um, you know, working with different children in Cambodia or China and so on. Um, I was doing teaching and then I was doing um, kind of like, like nurturing and looking after actual younger babies and so on. Completely different. But in turn, that's probably taught me patience. Um, that's taught me, um, I guess, a lot of emotional resilience because I was working with children with disabilities who were in an orphanage um, um, and it's taught me to I guess um, be kinder to the people around me um, and to be more grateful about the position that I'm in right now where I am in Australia like I said with all the tools that I can have to do what I what I want to do um, and yeah definitely adding on to the topic of procrastination um, definitely the purpose is there you know the passion is there um, and it's sometimes it's kind of hard to stick to our big goal. We have this huge goal and then it can get so intimidating, so intimidating that we shrink ourselves back. We're like, no, it's too much hard work. I'm not going to do it. But then what I learned is that, you know, when I break those down into small actionable steps, small and small into daily steps, mm -hmm. um, it's so much more easier than I thought it would be. And you don't have to commit to doing five hours in one day, every day. You can commit to doing 15 minutes a day every day and it makes it so much more achievable and those little things build up. Um, so I think that's, that's helped a lot. And um, definitely what the others were saying, a support network or community. Um, it is hard in terms of motivation, procrastination to do it alone. Mm. I, I still get that. Um, but um, being open to talking to people and hearing from them has even this interview with you guys. I, I don't know if I'll ever meet Ash or Lisa, um, but I get inspired from what they're saying and I'm learning little by little. And, and that's, that's building my own personal momentum to do what I want to do. Um, so I think that that network and community of people helps a lot. Uh, so yeah, that's what I want to say. Yes, Absolutely. resilience, resilience, yes. Resilience and persistence despite all odds <laughs> yes resilience um persistence connection communication uh, yeah. looking after yourself they're all um things that um the entrepreneurs in general yeah. um and yeah. social entrepreneurs specifically as we've mentioned a few times today is really um, know that purpose know your vision Definitely. and as you said creating those actionable chunks so i like to call them mil milestones at the moment yeah. Yeah. i think <laughs> i think goals just seem like a bit scary to a lot of people yeah. and so actually just making little milestones and so you just work to that milestone yeah. um and like it, I've, there's been times where I've fallen off track from what I want to do for a year or two. Maybe I'm looking after like my family or someone. I'm like my mum. I don't have my own children yet. Um, or, you know, I'm, I have to financially support myself and focus on making income, which is completely outside of what I want to do as a career. But I know in the back of my mind, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm where I want to be. This is what I want to be. And, and no matter how far I stray from that path, I'll always find my way returning to it. 
Mm. So I, I feel that you, 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 you'll feel like that too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I'm very guilty of working far too many hours <laughs> um, because I do love what I do. Um, and I, I know that also um, burnout is real. <laughs> um, and I've suffered that both working for other people and working for myself. But I actually probably found it more working for other people because I was burning out for the wrong reasons. Mm. And I was burning out um, and then like recharging, but then going back and doing the same things that weren't aligned with me and didn't um, feel right with me. And so, yeah, it, it kind of happened again and again. And so, yeah, nour nourishing yourself, I think, is a huge, huge part mm. of it. <laughs> like those, those things that um, we take for granted, like sleep and, and a healthy lifestyle and things like that but it's so important for your business success as well to if if you're you don't nourish yourself then um you're not nourishing your business i think um nina um brought up something um really important is also to enjoy the journey mm. i think that also comes down to you know making sure that you're healthy enough to enjoy that journey yeah um, yeah, it's so important to enjoy enjoy what you're doing and enjoy the journey um, wherever it ends, you know. It's, it's important. Yeah, that's definitely, passion's definitely another word that's come up a lot in this conversation, isn't it? Um, just make sure you're doing something that um, you're passionate about and that you, you feel that you can do as well. You're not doing something that's totally outside of your skill set. Um, unless you've got a powerhouse of people that that is their skill set. Um, I think it's important to, to know your lane and um, to do it well so you can you can have the greatest amount of impact as this, well. This is something that I want to share as well um, and it's something new to me. You know Marie Kondo, right? Yeah. And it's like, um, does it spark joy? You know, you throw out whatever doesn't spark joy and you grab onto something that sparks joy. That's how I feel about everything and anything. Opportunities my local park I just do whatever sparks joy I don't have to have an end goal for it mm -hmm. but if I like music you know or like singing even if I'm terrible I'll do it because it sparks joy so everything that I've done that has sparked joy has led me <laughs> to where I am to bring out what I want to do yeah it yeah. sounds like you're um doing some law of attraction stuff without maybe <laughs> even realizing it that you're just like following what what makes you happy and um yeah I literally, I literally just follow whatever makes me happy without without any rational thought <laughs> yeah I love that I need to do that I, I'm, yes if I want to dance in the rain that. I'll dance in the rain because it sparks joy <laughs> yeah yes love that I I promise you I'm going to do something that sparks joy tomorrow. I will let you <laughs> let know. Me know. Let me know. Yeah. I don't care how crazy it is. <laughs> <laughs> we have a quick, uh, a quick fire round to um, finish up. So I'll start with you, Nina. Passion or purpose? My um, purpose. Um, Startup or scale up? Startup. Um, dream big or start small? Dream big. Um, are you a visionary or creative? Creative. And upskill or outsource? Upskill. Cool. Uh, Lisa, we'll go, come on to you. Um, passion or purpose? I don't like those questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, right? <laughs> In one context. <laughs> um... I'm going to say, I'm going to say purpose. Okay. Start up or scale up? I'm going to say scale up. Um, dream big or start small? Dream big. Visionary or creative? Um, I'm a visionary. And um, upskill or outsource? Hmm. For me personally, I've changed from upskilling myself to outsourcing. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you. And um, Ash, um, one final quick fire round. Uh, passion or purpose? Purpose. Start off or scale up? Oh, scale up. <laughs> Dream big or start small? Start small. Visionary or creative? Visionary. And upskill or outsource? I like to upskill, but it's important to outsource. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> absolutely absolutely i'm very guilty of upskilling when i probably should upskilling. yeah <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> Hard, isn't it? When you like to learn and you're very curious to to you know not uh, not continually to upskill, but then you've got to. I think that's one thing actually as an entrepreneur that's really important is to learn that what you're good at, put your time into what you're good at and what you're not good at, outsource because even though it may cost you money, it's actually saving you money in the end. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Outsourcing definitely helps um, get a uh, faster growth. But I also do believe that having a little bit of knowledge yeah. actually helps you outsource the right person. Yeah, look, I totally agree with that, Rachel. I, I, you know, like I, I, I think this is one of the things that um, small business, uh, you know, people starting out in small business, um, it, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you, you should you, you need to know to be able to outsource. And I totally agree. I've, you know, like I've wasted quite a bit of money on outsourcing the wrong, you know, person. And um, and even some of the, you know, particularly um, for me and um, it, around the tech stuff because I, you know, like I, I, I still fit into the, I don't know, is it the gen... I'm not sure if it's a Gen X or Gen Y, but anyway. Um, but I, I think, you know, like, I, I, it's it's uh, it's taken me longer to learn the tech stuff, but there's so many names for a person who can create a website for you or, you know, who can do something, and it's like, well, I don't know what they are. Like, who, who, who am I supposed to be? Am I supposed to be asking for, a, you know, a content writer or a social, you know, like, it's it's difficult. So it's one of the one of the things that we try, we're going to try and... Um, try and sort of address also in um, the social chain makers group because I think a lot of people have those issues. So, you know, it'd be great for, for people who do have some of those skills to be able to talk, that, talk to it, yeah. Absolutely. And another um, side note to that is do you find one person that can do lots of things or do you find lots of people that are really, really good at that one thing? Yeah, yeah. it's a really interesting question. And, and, you know, like these are questions for another session, right? Mm. <laughs> we could talk all day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's I just um, am so grateful for your time and I really get a lot of pleasure of um, being able to host and facilitate these conversations because I just think that they are just so exciting to be a part of. Um, and, yeah, I, I hope that you have enjoyed it. Um, yeah, you do a great job facilitating, Rachel, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is a new skill to me. Um, but I just really wanted to do something to uh, make sure that I was staying on my vision, regardless of whether I was making money or not during these um, COVID times. And yeah. one of the major things that everyone that I was talking to was lacking was connection and communication. Um, mm -hmm. And so what better way to do it? <laughs> And I guess just for the viewers, um, for anyone that's watching, if you want to find out about the amazing Nina, Ash and Lisa um, that have been interviewed today, uh, along with the links to the businesses and everything that we have discussed, um, it will all be available uh, via houseofedenstudio.com.au. And uh, along with a lot of other um, amazing conversations by other social entrepreneurs um, to help inspire you. Another thank you to the three of you. I've um, really enjoyed this and 